And I realized with the certificates, I think because I didn't save them as a PDF, they look funny when you go to download them, like on your phone or whatever. But if you print them off, it should like print normally. All right, thank you guys so much for logging in. Um, my kids are here, obviously, so I apologize if you hear any background noise. I'm trying to keep them quiet as much as I can. Um, but I just uh, obviously appreciate everybody that's here, and I hope you guys are staying safe and feeling well. Um, Lauren, Aaron, did you get my email this time? Let me see, Aaron. Got it. Okay, good. So weird when I logged back into the chat, I didn't see it for some reason, but you weren't the only one. It was like three other ones I missed. Oh, okay. Just want to make sure you got it. Thank you, though. I do see it. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Cool. All right. So we're going to jump on to it. I'm just going to put this chat to the side. So this presentation is going to be on accreditation, quality in the classroom. Um, I, it kind of is going to have three parts. So first we're going to talk about sustaining a quality program. Um, can you guys see like me talking or no? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, now I can. Yeah. So weird. I can't. Okay, that's okay. Yeah, now I can see you. Um, nope. Oh, there I am. Okay. Um, Jackie, is there a way? Yes, I can. Okay, cool. Perfect. Now I can see what I need to see. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about three things. Sustaining a quality program, and that is going to be um, mainly based about what does a quality program look like, what does a pro pro quality program sound like. I used information here from Dawn. You guys probably know her. She's the Middletown Early Childhood um, Coordinator, resource person. She does the school readiness program, too. So some of the slides are from her on, on those, um, but they're applied to all programs, Todd's, twos, preschool, pre-K, um, she had some really good info for that first part. Second, we're going to go to maintaining a healthy and safe classroom. And that's really an overview for a lot of us um, watching in, from Middletown, Connecticut. Um, but it has good information that's universally applicable on um, healthy and safe classroom guidance and standards from NACI directly. Um, the third part will be on specific NACI accreditation specifics about specific criteria that they look for, um, some tools to use when you're going through accreditation, tools that you can kind of knock off what we've accomplished, some gaps that are left to fill, and they are really helpful for when you are planning before your assessor comes. Um, so first we're gonna watch a little short clip on the importance of early childhood education. A couple more people to let in here. All right. I think we've always understood that what happens early in life is important. We've always un understood that the love and responsive caretaking of uh, caregivers is important to infants. What's exciting and different now is that we understand that at a level of um, scientific knowledge that's increasing by the year. We understand it at the level of brain development, of genetic expression, and also how it links to later health outcomes. So we have a growing appreciation that brains are built over time, that they're built from the bottom up, and that that brain development occurs in the context of relationship. Before we can see things, the brain is being organized and genes are being expressed. So you take language, for example. It's tremendously important. Uh, the language that, that children are exposed to, that it's a, a rich environment, that um, they're talked to and responded to in, in a way that is sensitive and attuned. And all of that is preparing the brain, laying down the pathways that will lead to healthy, robust language development. So when they begin to speak, much of the work has already been done. Another thing that's important about that period of zero to three is it's the time of greatest 
opportunity. It's when uh, the sensitive periods are um, uh, um, create the most potential for healthy development, and also the potential to compromise development. And the relative strength or the relative vulnerability that gets wired in early is carried forward over time. So it's never too late to help kids. It's never too late to attend to their physical health or their emotional health or social well-being. But uh, the earlier that we're able to identify risk, the more effective, the easier, the, the more economical uh, the interventions and the course corrections are. So I really like that video because it talks about the richness of the environment, a lot of the factors that help us make a quality learning environment, which is we know that, and now more than ever, research is really showing us how value, vulnerable and how malleable the brain is from zero to three. And negative or positive, these experiences are literally shaping the genetic makeup of, of a brain. So um, we have such a critical role in, in helping achieve the best outcome and, and intervene when we need to, when we're noticing that maybe there is a challenge or there is some sort of gap. So I just wanted to re-emphasize how important the work we do is and, you know, early childhood educators just have a great role. Um, so we're going to go right into DAP. So sustaining a quality program. DAP is really important in sustaining a quality program. Um, a lot of the curriculum that we implement is based on DAP. So we know a program is um, showing us that it's following NACI accreditation and it's uh, exemplifying NACI standards when programs are gauging interests of the children in their care, that they're flexible in their scheduling, um, and they're adapting to specific cultural and family preferences. So there's a little list here, we don't have to go into everything, but um, some qualities of a good preschool or good educational um, early educational program are we see children using their time building with materials and building with a variety of materials the children aren't just walking around aimlessly that they have a lot to interact with that the teachers talking to them often um, they have the opportunity to work in small groups and large groups and some programs literally schedule their day that way where we have half the classroom go out in the morning half the classroom go out a little bit later than that and the teachers separate um, but however you can separate where children have the opportunity to engage with larger amounts of peers and then smaller amounts of peers and more one-on-one -on -one experiences with their teacher. You wanna show that variability um, in that day and that, that's a really important NACI kind of guideline. Also, um, we have you know classrooms that are <coughs> NACI accredited, have lots of children's artwork and it's displayed at their level. Not every single thing in the classroom, but there is some evidence of children's artwork displayed at, at their level. That children have the opportunity to work on projects for long periods of time. So they might start something on Monday, but they're extending on that learning throughout the week. Um, the curriculum's adapted, of course, and we want to make sure that we're sensitive to different cultural backgrounds, socioeconomic statuses, um, and differences in the classroom. Um, also, you know, we want to make sure that we're not using a lot of worksheets. Definitely um, want to have more creative um, teacher made um, and children made um, activities and, and um, plans that are, are more guided by the teacher rather than a worksheet. So here's some specific examples of um, what quality programs look like. So things you should see in all early childhood classrooms are a visual schedule, however you make that. With pictures, even pictures of real life make it even better. You can use an arrow and that's a good way for the children to manipulate or the teacher to manipulate exactly where they are in their day. Um, keeping it super simple, using clothespins, um, however, you know, you can have a flip chart if you don't like the visual schedule taking up too much of your wall, but things like that help us to identify where we are in our day and um, they are examples of a quality program. Also your calendar area. Um, this is kind of a new concept um, in Middletown, Connecticut that we're um, 
sort of trying to adapt in some of the preschool programs and twos programs. This is called a linear calendar. Um, so you, the idea is that you use some form of this linear calendar either in your calendar area, like where you guys have your greeting and group, or if you use it just in your math center as an example, but it's the example is here so you don't see the beginning numbers but this is just a snapshot it would go from 1 to 30 if there's 30 days in the month and the idea is that it helps children to read from left to right um and again this is an initiative in middletown connecticut but also other places are trying to get away from like the square calendar because this one helps children to see numbers in their correct order rather than numbers starting on a like the second row might be a seven and it doesn't really match this one progressively goes from one to 30 and it's also a way for them to notice patterns because they're seeing school day, school day, school day, you know, five school days in a row, and then a home day, home day. So it's pattern identification and real life um, linear number um, order. Uh, again, that does not a requirement, but just another example of a quality program. But also just having any days of the week um, in the classroom is uh, a NACI um, principle. Also, feelings area. So uh, really great qual high quality programs have feelings in their classroom. They have mirrors, they have felt boards with pieces, any kind of um, feelings, images um, in several places, more than once, more than one. Um, feelings posters low to the ground, feelings books, um, little uh, calm down corners with, um, more pictures of feelings. Um, this is another way we can implement high quality programming. Um, also, uh, oh, play systems. So this one I think is a really cool concept. A lot of centers use these. Um, so they're play center board systems. Um, again, this is not a requirement, but just another example of a quality program. So basically you either would make one board where ch children each have a clothespin and they, they snap on what center they're in and they can move around that board during their school day. Or you can have it where it's on the center itself, like on your writing center or on your table for math or on your um, dramatic play fridge and that's, that's your dramatic play center. And they actually manipulate their little person that stands for Lauren around their classroom around the day. And that's just a, a way for um, building executive functioning skills and learning, you know, it's my turn to play here and then next I'll go there. And it also keeps children um, playing, you know, it keeps order in your classroom um, rather than students fighting for what center they wanna play in. It, it's a nice way to have them in charge of their own playtime and their own work um, in their own space that they maneuver around in your classroom. It gives them a lot of self-confidence um, and it's a nice way to structure your day. Um, also numbers. So uh, another really important piece of NACI accreditation is numbers and letters around the room. But um, NACI really likes it for it to be in organic and natural ways, like not necessarily having a number poster, but having books that have to do with numbers or literally even seeing the children's names, names with their picture displayed somewhere. Things like that helps them to I to associate words with pictures. Um, family display boards are a really great way to have, um, again, showing that uh, appreciation for their family and their um, the differences and cultural backgrounds that all of your families bring to the classroom is, a, is having a family board. Um, and now we talked about everything that you might see in a classroom. So what does a quality classroom sound like? So obviously this is a reminder, but um, you know, things like, oh, that's so great. You pushed in your chair. Thank you. And thank you for speaking nicely to your friend. Saying, being really positive, naming specific things, um, using music, validating their feelings. So if you notice, of course, when sometimes there is going to be challenging behavior, but saying things like, I know you're not, you know, maybe that, that didn't make you feel the best, but let's come up with a way that we can work through it or solve it. Um, always using a loving and nurturing tone. Those are really great examples of what a quality program sounds like. 
Um, and these are just things that you can implement in your daily routine. So um, this is also coming from the Middletown Early Childhood Network. We have breathing and yoga, doing story time, making sure you implement gross motor activities with tunnels and balls, um, having a circle or group time with songs and music. Um, making sure that you're always using a learning plan, which we definitely do at our school, but um, you know, all schools really should be using some sort of plan where they're using either um, creative curriculum or some sort of curriculum uh, plan that they're implementing or, or basing, using as a basic framework for what they're doing for the week, making sure that that's posted, using sensory table. If you don't have a traditional sensory table, make sure you're using some sort of bin or Play-Doh or some sort of item that the kids can have hands-on experience with. Um, the use of an easel. Um, again, that's sort of, you know, a, a large piece of equipment. We don't all have that. I don't have one in my classroom, but maybe even like rolling out a big paper and putting it vertical, vertically so children are, are kind of painting standing up. Um, so that's kind of the overview of quality and what quality looks like, what it sounds like in the classroom. So now we're going to move on to um, having a healthy and safe classroom. So in Connecticut, we use um, the Office of Early Childhood, and they have the licensing standards and regulations that we follow. There's also NACI um, health and safety guidelines, and those are in section five of their um, program accreditation standards for earlier learning programs. So we're going to mostly talk about section five just because it universally applies to everybody but um, you can also find more information right on the OEC website about state regs pertaining to child centers. So um, section 5a talks about promoting protection children's health and controlling infectious disease. So basically the whole overview here is that you're using really great hand hygiene. So programs that are NACI accredited you're seeing teachers always washing hands and students. So before and after feeding a child, before and after administering medication, after handling garbage, even after cleaning. So remember after you use your bleach or after you're cleaning, that you're again going back and washing your hands. So um, section five as a whole really talks about um, using all of these regulations to benefit from education and optimize quality of life children need to be as healthy as as possible so health is a state of complete physical oral mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease um so basically we want to keep encouraging and ongoing um uh, health for our children so um let's see another really important one is when children are washing their hands and adults are washing their hands. We wanna make sure that they're rubbing vigorously for 20 seconds. Back of hands, wrists, between fingers, under and around any jewelry and under your fingernails. And so NACI takes the World Health Organization and other governing um, groups when they design their health and safety guidelines, um, just as a background. So another really great standard that I wanted to emphasize, there's so many under five, so under standard five, so I just took a few, but um, I thought this was pretty applicable. NACI says that we shouldn't use styrofoam containers or wraps when we're microwaving children's food and beverages. So that's another um, characteristic of a quality program is that you uh, instruct your staff never to use plastic or styrofoam, um, that you have designated changing areas that's separated by a partial wall. If it's not separated by a wall, that just make sure when you're designing your classrooms or rearranging that you have three feet from other areas that the children use. So three feet from where they eat, three feet from where they play. You wanna make sure that there's three feet distance from those um, changing tables. Another important one on the health and safety front is when infants arrive. So we talk a lot about safe sleep with NACI, NIAC accreditation. A lot of times teachers have difficulty or we, you know, we encounter the challenge when children come to the center sleeping. So if children arrive sleeping or they fall asleep in equipment not specifically designed for infant sleep, the, the pre best practice is to immediately remove that infant and put them in the right sleep equipment, which would be a crib. Um, 
so the health and safety, NACI, uh, NACI's health and safety guidelines also talks about nutritional well-being. So I, I wanted to touch on um, just foods that are safe to eat in the classroom and um, safe foods for senders to serve. So staff do not offer children younger than four. So that's um, in Connecticut, we have a three and under license and then a three and over, but also for four-year-olds. So this is important. Hot, so we don't ever serve hot dogs, whole or sliced into rounds, whole grapes, nuts, popcorn, raw peas, hard pretzels, spoonfuls of peanut butter or chunks of raw carrot or meat larger than can be swallowed whole. So again, you know, just things to keep in mind when we're serving or when if you're a center that has food items, you want to stay away from food items that look like this um, for children that are younger than four. Staff cut into cut foods into pieces no long larger than one fourth inch square for infants um, and a half inch square for toddlers and twos according to each child's chewing and swallowing capability. Again, those are NACI guidelines. You wanna also make sure that you check with your specific state guidelines, but it's still interesting to see um, what NACI has to say in terms of food service. Um, also for food service, clean sanitary drinking water is made available. At our center, the way we do it is children can have water throughout the day in a water bottle um, with their name on it. Um, and that's something that is at, um, in a bin at their level that they can continue to um, access throughout the day. Um, liquids and foods hotter than 110 degrees are kept out of children's reach. Um, breastfeeding and human milk storage. So this is a really um, important one for NACI. NACI likes to see that programs um, support and encourage and um, provide a comfortable environment um, for breastfeeding. So it looks to see that the program supports breastfeeding by accepting, storing, and serving expressed human milk for feedings. Um, new guidelines say that human milk should have, if it's, you know, in the bottle, it should have the infant's name, date, also the inclusion of the time the milk was expressed. So mm -hmm. bottles or containers um, should be immediately stored in the fridge on arrival. And also, if you're a center that can keep milk for more than, you know, the day, these are the temperatures that milk, breast milk specifically, is um, good until. So it should be in a refrigerator at 39 degrees. In Connecticut, we can have things in a refrigerator at 45 degrees, um, but NACI obviously is even more strict on um, the temperature of the refrigerator. Um, so here's some durations and times if you can keep breast milk uh, for longer than a day. At our center, we don't. Um, so section C um, of health and safety, according to NACI, talks about um, chemicals and what you can use in your center to clean. So um, chlorine bleach, if you're using a chlorine bleach solution, that has to be mixed daily. And the bleach and water solution ratio should be posted. Um, they also recommend that you can use, um, go to uh, epa.gov or you can go to greenseal.org and see what they have for their least toxic products and those are ones that are like government approved cleaning products to use in child care centers. Basically their whole NACI's whole health and safety um, premise and their their stance is that surfaces that may come in contact with potentially infectious body fluids must be disposable or made of material that can be sanitized. So that's why you know diaper surfaces need to be non-porous so they can be constantly clean. Staff use barriers and techniques that reduce the red of infectious disease and minimize contact of mucous membranes or of openings in skin with potentially infectious bodily fluids. When spills of bo bodily fluids occur, staff clean them up immediately with detergent followed by rinsing. After cleaning, staff sanitize non-porous surfaces by using the procedure for sanitizing designated diaper changing surfaces. So I also, later on, you'll see NACI's cleaning, sanitizing, and disinfecting frequency table, which again, might be even more um, intensive than your standard state regs, but um, still, you know, a nice reference to see. 
um, that you're also using detergent, shampooing rugs frequently, you're disposing contaminated materials and diapers in a plastic bag with a secure tie, then you're placing them in um, a bag in a closed container and your garbage cans all have secure lids. So those are sort of like the overlining principles that guide um, NACI's health and safety um, guidelines. Okay, so um, some more really important um, criteria that have to do with health and safety. A lot of these are pertaining to safe sleep. That's a really important initiative for NACI, also for the Center of, of, for the Disease Control, CDC, these come from. So um, safe sleep for infants. So uh, uh, programs that are accredited and programs that are showing high quality um, show that they have a written infant sleep policy that includes the following. Staff must place infants younger than 12 months on their backs to sleep without the use of infant sleep positioners unless ordered by a physician. If infants arrive to the program asleep or they fall asleep in equipment not specifically designed for sleeping, the infant is removed and placed in appropriate sleep equipment. Um, now this one I wanted to touch on because it's a requirement and must be met. Some of this criteria is okay if you don't meet um, when your assessor comes, but this one is a must be met. Teaching staff place infants on their backs to sleep without the use of infant sleep positioners unless ordered by a physician. So I just wanted to touch on that one because that's a must, a must be met. All right, so safe sleep for infants. Um, there's a little poster on the bottom right. It's a new one from our, our state um, licensing regulation agency is Office of Early Childhood. They put out these purple posters, so I will attach them in an email to everybody. Um, but there's also some information on safe sleep from the CDC. And I wanted to just go over that because it's a, it's a nice, nice video that I felt like was very comprehensive. Hi, my name is Sharon Parks Brown, and I'm here with my colleague, Carrie Cottingham. We are both scientists in CDC's Maternal and Infant Health Branch, which works to better understand Even play. 
So as you guys can see here, basically the gist of it is they took everything out of that crib. So they had like bumpers and there were some soft animals and other things. And, and essentially the CDC and NACI, um, Academy of Pediatrics, they want to emphasize that in order to prevent SIDS or to best help us in the prevention of SIDS is to remove everything we can from a crib. And there should be just a tight fitting sheet and the baby in also a you know a, a somewhat tight fitting um, sleep sack, and that's all that should be there. Um, one other thing to share. And the reason I'm showing a lot about infant care is because um, this is a really big important piece for NACI accreditation. Um, it is infant care. So this website is Connecticut's OEC <coughs> and it shows us um, things to remember. Always put a baby to back to sleep, clear your baby's crib, always close but never together. So sleep separately from your baby to keep them safe. Um, have support, friends, another parent, have a smoke-free environment and do not overheat your baby. This part, downloadable materials, they have some posters and I will send those through email. Um, to you guys and also the link is um, is here so um, we'll move on uh, again safe sleep we can see that this crib is free from bumpers and stuffed animals and um, we only have the baby in there and it's placed on the back a lot of teachers now, say, yes Lauren what if they roll over themselves on their their side of that's their okay I was, I was just going to, yeah, that, that's a good point. I mean, sometimes obviously you put a baby in the crib, they're going to roll over and that's, that's okay. Um, that's perfectly normal, but we would okay. want to initiate the sleeping by putting them on their back, but right, right. babies roll over and that's totally um, appropriate and that's safe. Okay. Um, okay. So now we're going to talk about um, accreditation specifics. NACI Early Learning Program Accreditation is the gold standard for recognizing quality in early childhood education programs. For more than 30 years now, we have been setting the standards for quality with our accreditation systems. Females who work in an AC accredited center um, is really important for me because it makes me feel like an expert in my field. I actually work with clients, so from that perspective, standards are huge for me. Most of the families are really happy with how things are happening in the center because of the quality education, not just basic safety, but quality interaction, quality education. It makes me feel good that I'm dropping my daughter off in an accredited center because I know that she's good at her education. When you get to the NACI accreditation, that means you're just, it's like a step. You need to try a very good job of being built in the program. Connecting practice, policy, and research, NACI accreditation helps teachers and staff at early learning programs develop a shared understanding and a commitment to quality. Accredited centers provide a solid foundation for all children's success, including increased educational attainment, healthier lifestyles, and more successful careers. We practice character education, whether it's these intangible skills like being patient, respectful, responsible, and those things carry over into personal relationships, the social emotional side. Families take comfort knowing that NACI recognized centers are providing their young children with a safe, supportive, and creative learning environment. My kids come home every day so excited to tell me what they've done and what they've learned. It's a conversation the entire drive home. It's awesome to know that they're having such a good time and being enriched all day long while I'm at work. Bringing my son to a NACI accredited center. Every day I left him with this sense he's going to be okay. Now that he's in middle school, he has the foundational tools and a NACI center was the direct effect, you know, of that. So thank you.
Nancy is quality. Nancy is educators. Nancy is young children. So I like that video because it really speaks to, you know, why we're doing this. Why is Nacy, what does Nacy's relation to quality? So really Nacy helps us to implement quality programs and gives us the tools and resources and guidelines so that we can um, design programs and classrooms that meet the NACI criteria and it's not about perfection and me meeting every single standard but it's about just doing what's best for children and creating an environment where they can learn and thrive. Um, this is just some information for what happens during your pre-visit um, and the protocols and procedures. Um, you'll get a 15-day window and then after the 15-day window you get the notice the day before um, when your assessor is going to come so this is in, in Part three of the presentation is um, accreditation specific. So we're gonna talk about a few more things um, that are specific to the accreditation piece. Um, they'll observe 50% of the total number of classes in your program um, to a maximum of 10 observations in all. So they will not see 100% of your program. Um, that's usually an important piece when you're going through this because you want everyone to be prepared in your building, but they might not see every class and they will not see every class. Um, an overview of the standards. Um, this right here just talks about the seven standards that NACI is going to look at when they come to your program. So they're going to look at relationships um, and that's between all children, the adults, um, and, and your relationship as a program in the community. They're going to look at curriculum. They're gonna look at teaching. They are going to look at assessment of child progress. They're gonna look at health, which is section five that we talked about in detail. They're gonna look at staff competencies, preparation support, and they're gonna look at families. And they're gonna look at community relationships, your physical environment, and then obviously the leadership and management team. These um, I wanted to touch on because they are the requ required um, NACI assessment items. These, uh, these items right here, you have to meet or you will not pass um, accreditation. So staff never use physical punishment and do not engage in physical abuse or coercion. Um, show that your guidance and discipline policy does not include any circumstances when it is permissible for staff to use any field form of punishment, physical, psychological, or coercion when disciplining a child. If more than one infant, toddler, or two-year-old cannot be easily heard and seen at all times by at least one member of the teaching staff, the child is or um, are in a safe environment. If one or more infant, toddler, or young two-year-old is out of the direct sight or sound supervision of all teaching staff while in a safe environment, it is for no more than five minutes. If a preschooler is out of the direct sight and sound supervision of all teaching staff, it is for no more than one minute and the child is in a safe environment. If a preschooler is out of direct sight or sound supervision of all teaching staff, it is for no more than 10 minutes. Um, and then there's a few others about uh, sight and sound. Um, so I wanted to include these because they are the must meets um, when you're going through uh, the accreditation process. Uh, cleaning, sanitizing, and disinfecting frequency. So NACI gives us this handy table. Um, you may use something else in your center, but this table tells us exactly what and when and how things in your classroom need to be sanitized. So it tells us about food preparation services, we're clean, sanitizing them before, <coughs> after, utensils, um, tells us what to do with countertops, refrigerator, monthly clean, um, tells us what to do with changing tables, clean and disinfect after each use. So as you can see, Everything's listed here on the left, and then it tells us when to clean them across the row. Um, floors should be cleaned at the end of each day. 
uh, mouth toys should be cleaned and disinfected and sanitized after, after the end of each day. So this is a great resource to have because it tells us even for dress up clothes, for example, we wanna clean these weekly. So throw your dress up clothes in weekly. Um, machine washable cloth toys weekly. So it's a nice, it's a nice tool to have um, for classroom usage. So you can see exactly when NACI wants us to clean. And um, again, helping us to achieve high quality in the classroom. Class portfolio tool. So as you're getting ready to go through accreditation, um, this is just a downloadable tool that you can use when you're putting together your evidence. It's listed obviously infant toddlers, twos, toddler twos is considered the same thing for NACI, uh, pre-K, kindergarten, and then the school age program. And again, that's a downloadable tool from NACI.com. There's also a professional development tracking tool for those that have to keep track of their staff. Um, I wanted to include this and I will also include this in the email. Um, and that's an easy way for your assessor to see how you are using professional development. Um, and the last thing is a self-study. So when you're going through accreditation, there is um, this tool you can use and it kind of gives us you a guidelines of how to start the accreditation process. You want to compile all your evidence, everything you do for lesson planning, your curriculum, um, how do you define your program, what evidence you can use to describe your program, photographs, activities, um, engagement activities that you've had, visitors coming in, anything you can use, you wanna compile everything you can when you're going through this, and then decide, okay, what are my strengths, what are my weaknesses, where are the gaps, what else do I have to compile, um, what other sources can I, can I lean on? Um, and then ultimately you are going to continue to gather your evidence. And the idea is that you would come back with even a stronger program that you had um, to begin with. And then there's a bunch of resources for who to reach out to when you're going through this process. Um, and then you, know, then you wanna think back on what parts of the classroom schedule changed? What equipment or materials were purchased? So obviously when you go through this, there's gonna be a lot of changes. Um, did, how did your staff grow? What are some new things you learned? How did attitudes change? So it's a nice self-reflection tool for you to use, for staff to use when you're going through accreditation because it is, it is a tremendous amount of work. But hopefully when you get to the other side of it, there's a lot of positive outcomes that you can just implement as you're new day-to-day -day operation. And that is it. Do you guys have any questions? There's lots to dream. There's a lot! <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I mean, it There's is like lot. endless. It's endless. And it's yeah. always changing. So this is, what I included here is like the current stuff from 2019. They do not mm -hmm. have the 2020 criteria out yet, but um, that's what I have for current. So when we- I found it very through. informative. Thank you, Lauren. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. Lauren, when we had to do those portfolios- Yes. Or you had to do them. Yes. They were individual for every- Age group? Was that um, right? Um yeah, so like toddler oh. twos is a one program, then the threes are kind of one program, and the infants are a program. Oh. But then the office also has to compile everything for like you know, section five like the health and safety part and the management. They they have one. And believe it or not, the guy the new criteria that I put in, the criteria has changed and they think this is like easier it's more simplified than how it was so ago. it changed lauren after you did all that only a couple things i think oh. the breast milk breast milk is like the big new thing they want breast milk labeled with the date expressed do we um, have to so do we have to do that in all the baby other infant bottles now they should be yeah 
So when we go back, we're going to have to put the make sure the parents write down the time. The parents should be writing the for you website. when they express the milk. Yes. Mm. Okay. There you go. Um. Yes. But there are so many. I mean, when in doing this, and I've had this for a long time, like on my computer. But there's there are a ton of resources when you're going through accreditation and. They have they have a policy and a procedure for any, everything everything and anything. <laughs> they have uh, there's there's a policy. I mean, if you follow the timeline or the the time the table for like the cleaning and disinfecting, it would be like immaculate if everyone did that every day. So, uh, and I'm sure now with COVID nineteen, I would imagine they'll even add more. I was oh, going to yeah. say their whole thing's gonna probably. Oh yeah, everything's going to change for cleaning. Yeah. Yes. So, but a lot of what they had in place was to prevent like the spread of something like that. So even like keep like we're in centers where you have doors, like even keeping all the classroom doors shut is put in place to prevent like the spread of disease and things like that. Now, Lauren, are you doing another one this week too? This is it. Poor Lauren. This is it for this week, but I think I actually am going to do one on um, indoor and outdoor learning environments, I think, next week. Ooh, cool. very exciting. So that will be like a fun one. I just have to like, a good one. look up some more. Um, I feel like that's such a fun space, like outdoor, like classroom experience. Yeah. So yeah that's that's when i'm going to start researching on i'll put that together for next week what what day and time is like good for everyone this is good this, time yes yeah, so yeah. this worked this, out yeah okay time. it's like before dinner time you know it's sort of like before dinner time okay yeah, yeah. cool so that's what i'll put together for next week um yeah so hopefully this is a good refresher i know we just went through accreditation but <laughs>